thousand miles to the north could hardly be in greater contrast. Yet here, in the 1950s, even more surprising evidence was found of early African history. Today the place belongs to the creatures of the desert, lizards, scorpions and snakes that can survive the searing temperatures of this thirsty land, one of the driest and most desolate regions on earth. Water is the rarest and most precious commodity. Yet even here it must once have flowed in abundance. The revelation of these rock paintings in the Tassili Mountains of the Algerian Sahara just 30 years ago astonished the world. Whole communities of people who were obviously African in origin had created marvelous galleries of ancient art depicting most vividly the life of the Green Sahara, as it must once have been. First we see hunting folk and the animals they lived among. The clearest proof that this region of the Sahara long ago teemed with wild game. The earliest paintings may be seven or eight thousand years old. But not all the people who inhabited this huge region were nomadic hunters. This horse, complete with saddle and bridle, points to the development of transport systems and traders. And this ox-drawn plough to the planting and growing of crops. Whether for war or sport, Elaborate chariots came into use, while the clothing of these people bears a striking resemblance to the tunics of ancient Egypt. The evidence of these paintings suggests a continuous community of peoples living right across the Sahara, from the Atlantic to the valley of the Nile. Then, some four and a half thousand years ago, the climate began to undergo a disastrous change. Gradually, the Sahara lost its rainfall, its animal life, and finally, its people. Abandoning their increasingly arid pastures, more and more people from the Sahara had to join their forerunners and follow the trails in search of a secure supply of water. Some headed for the tropical rainforests which lay to the south and west. Others moved east towards the valley of the River Nile. Fed by Africa's greatest lake, the Nile runs north for over 4,000 miles before reaching its outflow in the Mediterranean Sea. It's the longest river on earth and no river anywhere pushes on so relentlessly through mile after mile of vast and rainless desert regions while tumbling down from the mountain plateau of Ethiopia. But the Nile is more than a great river. It's a whole library of the history we're looking for. From the earliest times of human settlement along the river, some 10,000 years ago, the Nile was the giver of life to ancient communities who came to its banks and found on fertile soil that was enriched unfailingly, year by year, by the flood of silt. Those early people were among the ancestors of the Egyptians and the Sudanese of today. Others may have come from the Middle East. But the archaeological evidence combines to show that the main lines of incoming migration were from the southwest and the west. In other words, from the African communities of the Sahara.
5,000 years ago, this homeland had already become the scene of a civilization in many ways unmatched anywhere else in the ancient world. This is where we have to begin, in the Egypt of the Pharaohs, in the African land that was the gift of the god of the Nile. It's easy enough to believe within these corridors built to a gigantic scale and yet wonderfully proportioned that you've entered a world sprung complete from the lap of the gods. Egypt of the pharaohs was the greatest and the oldest and the most inventive of all the high civilizations of antiquity. And it flourished for 3,000 years. It set a pattern and example for peoples near and far. But where were its roots, its origins, its starting point? Most of us have believed or have been taught that the glories of the pharaohs could never have been created by African people or African ideas because, it's been said, Africans could never have built a high civilization. Here reigned, for dynasty after dynasty, the kings who wore the double crown, the combined crown, of Upper Egypt and of the Delta. But what had they to do with Africa? How could this grand hierarchy of gods and spirits have anything in common with the superstitious mumblings of the black peoples of inner Africa? Wandering among the treasures of the Cairo Museum, it's easy to think of the Egypt of the pharaohs as a civilization complete within itself, owing little or nothing to outside influences from whatever source, entirely its own creation. And I imagine that most visitors conclude as they listen to their guides that a statue such as this of the young king Tutankhamun may have turned very black in the course of centuries but could not have been a black man in the first place. It's a view which is now increasingly under challenge, not least from African historians and archaeologists. One of the more outspoken of these is Professor Sheikh Antadiop of Senegal, who has made a special study of the origins of the people of ancient Egypt. Contemporain des Égyptiens, et même des philosophes du XIXe siècle, voici dans le tombeau de Ramsès III, au XIIe siècle avant Jésus-Christ, les quatre races connues des Égyptiens représentées sur le même plan. Ici, vous avez l'Égyptien, le type générique de la race, en noir, charbon, si je puis dire, avec toutes ses particularités ethniques. Et sur le même tableau, vous avez le type indo-européen, représenté également, avec toutes ses différences par rapport au type égyptien du point de vue de la couleur de la peau et du point de vue du vêtement. Et ici, vous avez les autres Africains qui habitaient à l'époque l'intérieur du continent représentés de la même façon que les Égyptiens. That particular painting, however, is a rare exception. The only one, as far as I know, that so clearly makes the professor's point. For the most part, the ancient Egyptians had themselves portrayed as reddish pink. But of course, they intermarried with Asians, and even more with other Africans. Many of their noble ladies were Nubians, and lovingly portrayed as such. This painting comes from the tomb of Hemaka, clearly a black lady, with a handmaiden behind her, just as surely white. It followed that the royal children were often black as well, as was King Senusret, seen here wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. Or this pharaoh, of unknown name, but obviously of high prestige in his time, and just as clearly African. Elephantine Island in the Nile marked the border between Egypt and Nubia and was a place of great sanctity in ancient times. 
among the travelers who came here were the earliest European historians, the Greeks. Men like Herodotus, brought up as he was in the classical tradition which regarded the various races of the known world as different but equal. The Greeks knew Egypt well and firmly believed that the original Egyptians were black people who had come from the south to settle the land of the Nile. But Herodotus himself got no further than this. He was prevented by the first cataract from travelling further south. And so he never saw the huge temple which Ramesses II chose to build here at Abu Simbel, further south into inner Africa than any other great monument built by the pharaohs to celebrate their power. A few years ago, with immense ingenuity, the entire structure was lifted to a new site, above the artificial lake which has drowned all the sites of the most ancient kingdoms that flourished here in Nubia, even before the first of the pharaohs. But why should he have built this great temple so far to the south? Perhaps because his queen, Nefertari, was herself a Nubian. And also because these were the people, the people of the south, whom he wanted to impress with evidence of the prisoners he'd taken in faraway Syria and Asia Minor. Even mighty temples like this one have to be seen against the background origins of ancient Egyptian civilization. And those origins in the light of modern science were above all African. No matter what ideas or customs the pharaohs may have found in the Asian lands they conquered, Egypt's beginnings were in the south, in this inner Africa which the ancient Egyptians called the land of the gods, of the African gods whom they revered as their guardian spirits. The time came when Egyptian conquests ended. 400 years later, it was the turn of the kings of the south of Nubia, who now marched north to subdue the power of Egypt itself. And here is the most famous of those mighty kings of the south, recognized by the peoples of that time, the 7th century BC, as among the masters of the world. This one, as it happens, received a favorable mention in the Bible, in the Book of Kings, as the emperor of Kush and of all Egypt, whose name was Taharqa. By 650 BC, the Nubian kings, who had subdued Egypt, were ready to withdraw to the south, to Napata, and then to a new capital in their kingdom of Kush, at Meroe. And there we must follow them, if we are to understand the history of this inner Africa, which exercised so strong an early influence on ancient Egyptian civilization, and which later was to reflect that influence. The city of Meroe was situated a thousand miles south of the old Egyptian frontier, far into inner Africa. I never come here without a sense of wonder, for right ahead in the midst of this pitiless desert, there stands one of Africa's great historical surprises. remnants of a lost civilization, standing across the skyline as though shipwrecked on the sands of time. These are the pyramid tombs of the kings and queens of Meroe, who reigned and were buried here through more than six centuries. Long ruined by tomb robbers and by time, the pyramids are being restored 
and even reconstructed. Meroitic civilization still presents many puzzles. One is that the monarchs of Kush built their pyramid tombs long after such monuments had ceased to be raised in Egypt. Partly because the pyramids of Meroe are neither as old nor as massive as those of Egypt, it's been assumed that all this was a mere provincial copy of that greater civilization. In fact, it was far more than a copy. The similarities are there, but other aspects of Meroitic culture are found nowhere else. Another intriguing question is the relationship between the ancient people of Meroe, kings, queens, and citizens, and the modern Nubians who live in this region today. We can still see their stylized portraits in stone, but what did they really look like? I asked Dr. Ali Osman of the University of Khartoum. Oh, they look like me, of course. I am a Nubian. Uh, um, very much the, the Nubians of today are the Nubians of yesterday. We, we got to understand that rather carefully, because the Nubian culture actually have not yet been very much explored. The Nubians from within, I, the Nubian, what I do and how I behave, wouldn't have changed that much from what the medieval Nubians ha have done. But the influence that are coming on us as Nubians, uh, starting as early as, you could say, the Egyptian, and coming down to the Muslim and Arab influence, have been changing. That does not mean that the Nubians have changed. But this identity has had to survive many foreign incursions and even conquests. At one time, Meroe fell before the invading armies of Aksum, another ancient kingdom high in the mountains of what is now Ethiopia. In more recent times, the Turks and the British have sent in their armies of occupation. Most lasting of all has been the influence of Islam. But through all these changes, the Nubians have done more than retain their identity. Just as they absorbed influences from elsewhere, so they too have had a deep cultural impact on their neighbors. They build now as they've always built, in all probability just as the people of Meroe built, with an old effort-saving rhythm constructing mud walls to defy the scorching heat of the Nubian summer. Their beds are no different from those of their ancient ancestors, like this one in Khartoum Museum, with a pattern of headrest which is much the same here and right across Africa as those of 5,000 years ago. And the traditional clan marks cut into this Nubian's face can be seen exactly reproduced on a stone relief which decorates one of the pyramids just a couple of miles away. It's been said that Meroe was the Birmingham of ancient Africa. And that wasn't altogether a flight of fancy, for the people of Meroe had a very extensive iron-making industry. Just consider this enormous pile of industrial waste, of slag. It proves that among the major activities of the people of this flourishing city was to smelt iron. And here is a bit of the residue. A few yards away stood the great temple of Ammon, Meroitic, although dedicated to a very Egyptian god. And somewhere in the sand, if I can find it, there's another remarkable fragment of inner African originality. 
Here it is, a stone inscribed with a fully operative script that was invented for the African language of Meroe in the 3rd or 2nd century BC. 23 signs for letters and a word divider. One of the earliest alphabetical ways of writing invented anywhere in the world and still a puzzle for modern scholarship. In wealthy houses surrounding the temple were found some of the comforts and enjoyments of Meroitic life. The style of these pots is uniquely Nubian and repeated nowhere else in the Nile Valley. Half a day's journey from Meroe by modern transport, a little further into the sand and rock of the Bhutana desert, there stands another complex of stone buildings, this time dedicated to the gods of Kush and not to the gods of Egypt. Nowadays, this place is called Musawalat. Strange hints remain among the ruins, like this old lion in the sand. But what were these buildings for? Perhaps the kings of ancient Kush strolled beneath these colonnades. Historians have offered this or that explanation. My own is that the principal function of this unexampled and partial building made it unique in the ancient world. This function, I think, was for the taming and training of the great African elephant. That seems to be the best explanation of the remarkable stone ramps which occur here, like this one, and that one over there, and another long one going over there. We can accept that the taming of the African elephant, bigger and more difficult to handle than its Indian cousin, had become a speciality of the Kushites of Meroe. With their skills, they converted this, the greatest of Africa's wild animals, into the military tank of the ancient world. When Hannibal of Carthage invaded Roman Italy across the Alps, he had 38 war elephants in his army. The skills of the elephant trainers of Musawarat may well have contributed to that legendary feat. These temple walls provide a surprising reminder of much greener times with abundant pastures for domestic grazing. All that has vanished as the desert advanced from the Sahara the civilization of Meroe disappeared. Today, away from the banks of the Nile, only nomads can survive. This well has never been known to run dry. The scene is exactly as it was when I first came here, some 30 years ago, and I doubt if it's changed very much in a thousand years. Proud and self-sufficient, these people seem untouched by the modern world. It's rare to see a single mass-produced item among their belongings, or anything made of plastic. It's as if they share a determination to rely on nothing but themselves and their animals. Visiting Europeans have usually made the mistake of judging the degree of civilization among different peoples by the number of their possessions. The ancient traditions of these nomads reach back to the very beginnings of history. And should they still remember their ancient gods, those too are still here, not yet swallowed up by the encroaching sand. Here at Naga, there's an even more remarkable mixture of local and imported influences. King Natakamini triumphs over his prisoners in a very Egyptian style. The python, on the other hand, was an inner African religious symbol, regarded in many lands down to this day 
as a figure of spiritual power. And this representation of the lion god looks quite Indian with his three heads and four arms, but he too is uniquely Meroitic. The kingdom of Kush collapsed in the 4th century AD, but evidence has recently come to light that some of its people migrated across the plains of Cordofan towards the Nuba Hills. Less influenced by Islam than the Nubians along the Nile, the people of this region have become of considerable interest to historians because they may be closer in their way of life to the Nubians of old. As it happened, we chanced on a special day among these Nuba people, a bit like a cup final. This is Africa as it can still be found, away from tourists, motor cars and big cities, celebrating in its own fashion. A number of cultural links have been found to suggest that these people may well share a common heritage with distant ancestors who lived in the time of the kings and queens of Kush. Village teams, each wearing its own distinctive color, have gathered from a wide area to take part in one of the oldest of all sporting events, but also a passion among the Nuba, wrestling. So intricate are the rules governing not only the contest itself, but also exactly who may wrestle with whom on the basis of family relationships, that it's almost impossible for a visitor to follow all the moves. But for the historian, there's another close relationship between the Nuba wrestling of today and that of ancient times. Dating from around 2500 BC, these vivid paintings have been copied from an Egyptian tomb at Beni Hassan. Increasingly, it seems that these people can indeed trace their past back to civilizations in antiquity. And their ancient sport provides one more small piece of evidence of a continuous social tradition that's lasted for centuries. Yet these are the very people whom the 19th century explorer Samuel Baker described as human nature in its crudest state not to be compared with the noble character of the dog. <laughs> After the contest comes the celebration. Some of these Nuba girls may well be Muslim, but it's no part of their tradition to hide their faces behind veils. They have a pride and place within society, in line with the customs of old Nubia, and even of Meroe itself, whose rulers were often women.
In another part of Zenuba Hills, just a few miles to the southeast, the teachings of Islam have made no headway at all. The people of these villages have quite consciously chosen to reject either Western or Islamic dress. Free spirits under an African sky, young girls dance as much for their own pleasure as for the spectators, breathing life into these astonishingly similar images of Nubian dancing girls, performing for the pharaohs 5,000 years ago. Famed for their grace and beauty, they had an honored place in the life of ancient Egypt. That the one should still be regarded as primitive and the other as part of the world's cultural heritage reflects on the ignorance and prejudice of the modern world. And not at all on them. On the day that I visited Meroe, a pyramid was being rebuilt, not with the aid of bulldozers and cranes, but by the traditional techniques used in their original construction. As each great shaft of masonry was hauled up the ramp and pushed into place, for me, the continuity of African history was brought directly alive. The Egypt of the pharaohs did not spring whole and complete from its own local genius. It owed much to inner Africa. In the years ahead, more evidence will surely come to light which will emphasize that it's to the whole of the Nile that we must look, and to lands lying far in the interior for the source and origin of these great civilizations that have flourished along its banks.